Oh dear. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the 8-Bit Adventures Podcast. Bringing you the latest and greatest geeky news of the week. Uh, just had a little bit of a microphone issue where, once again, Windows restarted and thus uh, yeah, it set my microphone to be the wrong one in OBS. So thanks a lot, Windows, and thanks a lot, OBS, uh, without fail, every time it happens. Um, so I hope everyone's had a good week. I uh, hope you all are staying safe, staying healthy. Uh, we're, we're trying to do that here. <laughs> It's, uh, we've got a lot going on. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're in, in the process of doing some, some big life change stuff. So, uh, let's see, uh, aside from that, um, there's not really a whole lot of news this week outside of, uh, perennial troublemakers now, Activision Blizzard, they're, they seem to be in the news every week because something happens. Um. But, uh, the latest D&D book, uh, Strixhaven, A Curriculum of Chaos, uh, was released this week, so we'll be talking about that in our deep dive. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like I said, not a whole lot of, uh, of, of actual big news this week. Um, I know, like, Halo Infinite's out, uh, or something, you know, some something something involving Halo Infinite is is out ready. It might be like multiplayer's out or ranked multiplayer or whatever. Um I just it it looks like all of the news are there's like there's always seems to be multiple news articles just about Halo Infinite but like not actually like really noteworthy stuff. It's all like very granular things happening in the game and it's like eh, that might be a little little too niche going on. Um but uh, why don't we why don't we get right into the news so uh, we can talk more about Strixhaven, shall we? All right. So first up, Activision Blizzard. It's it's another week, another round of uh, of bad news for Activision Blizzard. So, a subsidiary of Activision this time, uh, Raven Software, which does QA for, uh, has done QA for a number of recent Call of Duty titles, uh, has announced, laid off one third of its QA department uh, around Christmas, despite Call of Duty uh, in 2020 bringing in about $3 billion in revenue. Um, so it's roughly about 12 people are being laid off. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's always the case, right? Is uh game brings in like record or record revenue, if not record profit. Uh, and then, you know, these folks, uh, it was sort of like their contracts not being renewed. However, they were asked to relocate to Wisconsin for this job. They weren't given any, you know, relocation assistance. And then, like, after two years are being told, yeah, you're done. You know, w without any notice. So, yeah, that's sort of, it's it's one of those things where, like, this has happened before. But now that Activision Blizzard, as a whole, is kind of under a microscope over every little thing that they do, stuff like this is going to get magnified. Um, in addition, so, uh, so they will keep their current nominations, but they will not be present at the game awards. They, I guess they were they were told, don't show up. We don't want you here. Uh although a member of their board is like on the director committee for the game awards. So you know, it, it might be a fruitless gesture, especially since they got to keep their nominations, but uh finally with Activision Blizzard, uh attorney Lisa Bloom, who is sort of a very high profile sort of celebrity attorney. Um, is representing a current employee, uh, only first name given, Christine, um, who held a press conference today at the Blizzard Irvine campus um, talking about Christine's experiences at the company, uh, namely related to harassment and unwanted advances, reporting those uh, incidents, or, or being told not to report those incidences uh, to HR, 
when she did report those incidences to HR, uh, was then, you know, alleged uh, denied promotions and actually, like, uh, uh, had, like, pay cuts um, as retaliation. So, th again, this is all just, like, if you've been following uh, the, the news that's been reported on Activision Blizzard, it's just like, well, yeah, this is par for the course. This is what's been happening the whole time. Um, but it's the fact that, like, it's being so publicly talked about at a press conference on the campus um, that happened at noon today. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it, again, suits are still ongoing. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we will see. Um, hopefully there's like enough external pressure from everybody that uh, that maybe it might inform. Um, you know, uh, if and if and when damages will be um, uh, assessed. Um, that hopefully it's on the higher end and it's actually punitive as opposed to. You know, oh, well, this is just a fine, so we'll just pay it. Um, So, yeah. So it's just, once again, Activ like, Activision Blizzard seems to be the big thing. Like, anytime there's news about it, like, that's what gets talked about in the news cycle. Otherwise, a lot of it's just, like, when PS5s are available. Or when will PS5s become available. And it's like, that, that's, that's not really, that's not news. And then you have to go in and update it, like, ten minutes later. And say, like, oh, nope, they're gone. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker. So, as expected, uh, Endwalker's early access suffered from excessively long queue or long log in queues. Say that three times fast. Uh, Square Enix mentioned this. They said, "Like we just want to warn you, this is probably going to be a disaster," <laughs> and uh, it kind of was. Um, demand far exceeded capacity. Uh, the servers were running at maximum capacity. There were lobby errors. The, I guess it's the dreaded 2002 error or 2002 error that, uh, when you reached the end of the queue, you got like some sort of lobby error that then like kicked you out of the game and thus like put you back into the queue. Um, if you were playing on a very popular server, you know, your queues were like dozens of thousands of people long. Um, so, I mean, this is... Again, this is to be expected. It's a big MMO. It's a popular MMO right now. Everybody wants to play. And, I mean, this is what happens when an expansion launches. Like, there's queue times. Everybody wants to get in. Uh, and it's just the fact that, like... So, early access was being given to paid subs, I believe. And so... Uh, the, the idea of calling it, like, early access... It, uh, I mean... That just would have been launch day for, you know, for those of us who played World of Warcraft back in the day. Like when, you know, because you still really can't, like there is a free trial, but it's not really much of a free trial. Like there are no free to play players for World of Warcraft, really. Uh, but yeah, so lots of errors. They'll get sorted out uh, as people sort of figure out demand and when they're able to play and things like that. Um, so, yeah. I also, I tend to think, uh, you know, you, you might want to launch expansions, like, not near school vacations, because I think that's where a lot of your demand is going to come from, but anyway, uh, hopefully those get sorted out soon for people that want to play Endwalker, um, I know they're putting measures in place, like, between the queues and stuff like that, uh, but they're actually, like, enforcing measures of you have to actually be engaged in the game and playing uh, in order to stay logged in. So uh, I guess a popular thing, like, as a social activity was to just, like, all gather in hubs and just, like, you know, put your dance emote on and then just sit like that for, you know, an hour or so. Like, that's not going to fly. You are not being counted as being engaged with the game if you do that. Uh um, not really clear if, like, um, I guess some other, um, proposed ways of circumventing that were, like, auto-attacking at, you know, target dummies, uh, like, uh, for, for, like, DPS dummies and things like that, uh, or auto-running in place, um, or, like, auto-running into a wall or something, 
uh, it might flag those as not being engaged um, and still boot you after 30 minutes. I'm not sure. You know, it, it mentioned it in the articles that I was reading, uh, but then, like, it didn't really specify. It wasn't clear to me if, like, Square Enix was going to not count those as engagement or if those were ways that people, like, had traditionally bypassed it and no longer worked or if they still worked or whatever. Um, so here's hoping that uh, if you're trying to cheese your way into staying in the game longer while not actually playing, that you you get you get booted back in line with everybody else. Um, so, yeah, for uh, for FF14 players, I hope that you are able to play. All right, next up, Ubisoft Quartz. This is the much maligned uh, uh, NFT program from Ubisoft. Uh, this will launch with uh, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Um, Quartz will use uh, uh, Tezos, the Tezos cryptocurrency. I, uh, I hate reporting. I, I hate all of this. Uh, and uh, it will connect to uh, a user's existing crypto wallet uh, to allow the purchase of digits. That's what uh, they're calling their 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 tokens or their items or whatever. So digits are in-game items that include, you know, weapons, vehicles, cosmetics, other stuff like that. Uh, they will be artificially scarce. They will have serial numbers like attached to them, um, both in-game and like visually attached to them so that you'll be able to tell. Uh, but Ubisoft... Um, unlike Steam trading cards and stuff, they don't want them to be limited to their own ecosystem. So in theory that, like, you could take them to eBay and trade them, I guess. I don't know. I hate this. <laughs> I I absolutely... And it also, like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, so the reason why, like, yeah, you'll be able to trade them. Uh you know, outside of the game, but, like, you can still only use them in that game. Like, so, yeah, I, I don't know. This strikes me as, like, there would be, like, there could easily be ways to do this without requiring cryptocurrency and without requiring, you know, NFTs. Uh, it's, it's supposedly using, uh, one of the, I guess Tezos is one of the ones that, like, is supposed to be more environmentally friendly, but that's also, like, saying, uh, like, cleaner coal. Um, like, it still requires, like, a lot of processing power. Um, which also means, you know, it's still driving up prices of graphics cards, uh, because there's still shortages on chips and stuff. Um. So, yeah, uh, so that's launching, uh, if you're listening, or if you're watching live, it's well, launching tomorrow, if you're listening to this on the audio version, launching today, December 9th. So, uh, yeah, I hate it. All right, moving on. <laughs> All right, Tesla, haven't had Tesla on the, on the podcast in the news section for a while. Uh, they did a recent over the air update that allows drivers to uh, whether it, this is intentional or not, uh, allows drivers to play games uh, from Tesla Arcade on the touchscreen while the car is in drive. So this is this is bad. <laughs> like uh, the intention is to allow passengers to play the games on there. Um, although I think a statement was made from Tesla that like, there were three games that are supposed to be able to be played by the driver, and it's like Solitaire um, and like two other ones, you know, very basic games like that. Uh, you know, obviously. The the ultimate goal is that you shouldn't be allowing things that require enough of your concentration, like playing a game to be done while you're supposed to be driving. Um, so this has led to formal complaints uh, to the NHTSA. Uh, 
um, which is sort of taking renewed interest in Tesla after some self-driving snafus uh, and navigational issues. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's it's one of those things where like, number one, it, why does the car have its own like arcade marketplace? <laughs> like uh, number two. I guess why? Why? Like, why even have games? I, like, why not just limit it to functions for the car itself? Uh, I just, I don't understand at that point. Um, you know, it's one of the things where if you are buying a Tesla, you likely have a phone, right? And why you wouldn't just use that, I, I don't know. Um, so this having games available on the touchscreen just seems like trouble in my mind. Um, and also uh, for games that like you're not supposed to allow the driver. Um, apparently, it's just like you just sort of like in Pokemon Go where it's just like, a, no, I'm a passenger and you click that button and it just takes you through to the game. Um, so like it's not really a, a, a way to prevent people. Um, I don't know. I would, I guess, you know, there may be some talk of like having a camera in there to detect whether what seat you're in. Um, I would say just don't do it. Just don't even have a Tesla arcade set up in there. Like, why? Why? You make cars. <laughs> just stop. Uh, so, yeah. So that is uh, that's sort of a new issue that's happening with that all right that is going to wrap up our uh quick fire news for this week as i said not a whole lot happening not a whole lot of really interesting stuff happening just a lot of where to find ps5s halo infinite scuttlebutt um over like multiplayer uh as continues to be the case um and just you know activision blizzard be in trouble being a disappointment uh so why don't we switch gears and uh let's talk about strixhaven a curriculum of chaos <laughs> okay so uh so strixhaven latest dnd book out from wizards of the coast um uh, it's their uh, latest tie-in with Magic the Gathering, um, as it was a Magic the Gathering setting. Uh, this was billed as a campaign setting book, um, sort of in the style of Mythic Odysseys of Theros and a Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Uh, this is not that. <laughs> this is not a campaign setting guide. Uh, it has like a very brief chapter in the beginning that sort of talks about Strixhaven and like the background of it. Um, ultimately this is a, this is an adventure book. Like this is, this is a lot more like uh rhyme of the frost maiden or ghost of salt marsh than it is, uh, you know, like Guildmaster's guide to Ravnica or, um, Eberron, uh, you know, rising from the last war. Um, or even the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, even though nobody really likes that book. Uh, or even, you know, like, it's, it, I guess it's more like uh, uh, Curse of Strahd than it is Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, if that makes sense. So, like, it gives you background in order to run an adventure, or to run the adventure at Strixhaven. But the main focus of the book, like, the vast majority of the book, is this series of adventures. Uh so I apologize. Uh, my son is. We're trying to put my my wife's trying to put my son to bed and he is very upset about that. So. Uh, all right. Uh, Owlin is a new character option. Uh, so for those that are watching live, we've got the little little owl person in the artwork there. Uh, they had a really interesting uh, sort of setup in the Unearthed Arcana where owl folk were introduced 
um, had some really nice flavor to them. Uh, most of that was cut. And so what we have are basically Aarakocra that cannot make Talon attacks, uh, but instead get stealth and 120-foot uh, dark vision. And that's it. So, uh, you know, basically the features that they get that aren't just, uh, you know, inherent to all um, sort of base uh, species kits or folk kits moving forward are... 120 foot dark vision, no drawback. Um, they get a fly speed, can't be used if they're wearing medium or heavy armor. Uh, one of the things that I have an issue with for that is they also they don't specify if like that you can't fly if you're carrying more than your you know maximum weight, like what what you can carry. Uh, which I think that is a bit of an oversight, unless it has in the rules that, like, you can't move when you're doing that anyway. Um, I'd have to double check that. Um, and then proficiency and stealth. That's all you get. That seems very bare bones to me. Um, it's kind of boring. Uh, and I, I really wish that they had sort of kept a lot of the magical stuff. Um, that they were trying to put onto uh, onto this kit. Um, so that's a little disappointing for me. Uh, they cut the subclass ideas. They cut like the the um, idea of like it's a generic subclass that like different classes could take um, in favor of now. Uh, there are there's like one background for each of the various colleges um at at Strixhaven uh and those backgrounds you know they get they they function like regular backgrounds the benefit that they give is a feat which is essentially a specialized form of oh dear i can't remember the name of the feat but it's the one that like gives you a first level spell and two cantrips um so i think that's the first time that we've seen a background give something that has like a very mechanical benefit usually like the feature of a the feature of a background is like more of a role playing um social uh type thing either you know role playing or exploration type of type of benefit um so just straight up mechanical benefit uh and ultimately um the idea is that, like, even as a non-spellcasting character is now this gives you an avenue to, like, just get a few spells. Um, I will say, uh, you know, now that, like, if you factor in subclasses, there are actually very few, like, class-subclass combinations compared to, like, out of the entire variations of them. Um that like don't have access to any magic at all. Uh so I feel like even if you were gonna play like a champion fighter, uh you could still find somewhere to fit in in Strixhaven. Um like which seems a little weird. Like why would you why would you make a completely martial character at a magical university? Uh but I think like there's still ways for I think it's you could still be like a like a scholar or or researcher of magic and not be able to cast any magic yourself. Um and I think that might be an an interesting exploration for someone who wanted to who doesn't necessarily want to play spellcaster uh but still wants to go to wizard school. Um you know, I think that's interesting. But I was also thinking like they they talk about um like barbarians for example. Like you don't usually associate barbarians with magic, but like uh, if you pick Path of the Ancestral Guardian, like, you might pick Lorehold, which the whole point of Lorehold is, like, learning about archaeology and history and stuff through communing with ancestral spirits. Uh, and so it's like, you could you could use that as a tie-in to your subclass and, like, learn about your, basically, magic that way, um, which I thought was interesting. So it opens up to things like, you know, you don't really think of... Um, 
I mean, I guess like rangers are inherently magical. Um, they weren't so in fourth edition, um, but they've had a little bit of spell casting. Like you could explore that. Um, you know, paladins, rangers. Uh, you know, even uh, um, you know, Eldritch knights, uh, arcane thief. I can't remember what the name of the subclass is for rogues. Uh, you know, uh, way of the shadow hand monks or or elemental monks. Um, you know, just just anything that like arcane trickster. Thank you, thanks, Driz. Uh, but yeah, Arcane Trickster would fit right at home here. Um, but again, like, as long as, you know, I would argue, even if you don't have any spellcasting talent, there's still ways for you to interact with the college itself, even if it's just to learn about magic. I think, I think, honestly, Thief Rogue, because they eventually get, like, at high level, they get the ability to ignore magic item requirements, would be really interesting. Um, you know, as uh, from that perspective, um, you know, or even like you could flavor some of your abilities as being somewhat magical, um, or at least like supernatural, uh, since fifth edition doesn't make a distinction between like supernatural abilities and extraordinary abilities for those that are familiar with third edition, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, so again, focus is a lot more, there's not a whole lot of character options, like they did away with subclasses. There's like a couple feats. One notable thing about, uh, one of the feats, like, which gives you a familiar, is that it has a level requirement. I don't know if we've really seen that in 5th edition yet. Um, typically they've tried to stay away from level requirements. Uh, and even to a certain extent, like, ability score requirements, like, and seem to just focus on like relying more on whether it's useful for a character or not as opposed to locking it out from a character um i think what this means is uh you like it just prevents you from selecting it at first level if you're a human or if you're playing um the like custom lineage or custom heritage uh option from tasha's um, and it like forces you to wait until fourth level to pick it as your first feat, uh, in that way. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just thought it was interesting that it makes you, it, it makes you wait. Um, I wonder if there would, would be, I don't know if there was a more elegant way of doing it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, there's like one spell, like one custom spell for each, for each college. That's kind of it. Like, so, and that's why, like, it ties in. That that would be a lot for an adventure that's not a lot for a a setting guide. Um, and of course, there there's going to be complete egg on my face if it turns out, like, they really talk this up as an adventure book and not a campaign guide. It's just the fact that, like, all of the other Magic the Gathering settings have been campaign settings and not, like, an adventure. Um, and I'll get to the actual adventure part because there's there are some interesting things that they do. Uh, I just I really want to talk about the the character option stuff first. Um, you know, all in all, uh, and there's also like a couple magic items. Um, you know, I I think on the on the character option front, um, I was a little underwhelmed. I think. Uh, you know, I think there there could have been some interesting stuff that they put in, especially like, you know, if they wanted to provide the design space, they could have made a bunch of custom subclasses for each class that like would thematically fit. Um, and ultimately, like, it's just relegated to a feat. Uh, and all that feat does is it just gives you bonus spells. Um, so is it really worth I don't know. Uh, so I mentioned uh, the familiars so they do have a bunch of little mascots so each college has its own mascot um, I think that's an interesting one a lot of them are very like unusual 
concepts. So like one is a fractal, like an animate fractal. Uh, there's another one, which is like an art elemental uh, that I thought was really interesting, which it's it's. Taking the concept of weirds from Ravnica, where it's like using opposing elements or disparate elements and combining them together uh, to create like a new type of elemental creature. But it's just like doing that, but then using performance to channel it into being, um, you know, it's not like it's made of glitter <laughs> or or, you know, uh, a psychic energy or something. Um, but, uh, you know, provide nice little benefits. Uh, you know, I think the I think the colleges themselves are fairly interesting. Um, one thing that I did not expect them to do, which was something that I was toying around with deities for uh, my own setting, was um, each of the colleges focuses on a uh, dichotomy in their philosophy. So, uh, like, Prismari, which is like the arts college, um, is like perfection and expression. So it's like, uh, very analytical, well thought out, methodical, like, uh, uh, very intellectually creating an art piece and like, uh, designing it so that it makes the the audience think. Um, whereas you know, our expression is like, uh, taking art as like the ultimate form of expression, and you don't think about it. You just like do what you feel and like apply yourself to the canvas or into your performance. And like your job is to instill feelings and experiences in people. Um, and you know, I would say truly great pieces do both. Um, but the idea is in each of these colleges is that like you have these two sort of opposing ideologies and they uh they they foster debate and arguing. Um and it's not necessarily one's right and one's wrong, uh but it's um that uh students are encouraged to try and figure their own way by navigating these two opposite um, philosophies. And like, as a first year student, like you're assigned two advisors, one from each philosophy in the, in the, you know, in the college that you're assigned to. So it's like, you know, you go to ask one for advice and they'll give you one form of advice and you go to the, ask the other one for advice and they'll give you like something totally opposite. And it's up to you to figure out how do I, how do I use this? How do I process this? Um, which, uh, I guess sort of tangentially relates to the next point. There is a lot of focus on sort of narrative play, I want to call it, and, and role play in this adventure, uh, without mechanics, right? Uh, so, you know, one of my, one of the schools of thought for me is, you know, what D&D &D does really well from a mechanics standpoint is providing a lot of interesting choices for players when it comes to, you know, combat, basically. Um, and one of the avenues that you could do to make the other pillars of the game more exciting is to build systems that also reflect combat, or reflect the other pillars the same way as combat. Um, namely social and exploration. Dean doesn't really do that and relegates it to like make skill checks or, or make ability checks, use skills, uh, do it however you want. Um, and then, you know, there's been in recent years, they have talked up because like with this book, they talked up like, oh, we're going to have like a relationship system and, and this and that. Turns out it's not a system. And I was thinking about it before the podcast today, and uh, really what it is, is this relationship system that they touted when marketing this book is really just a very, very watered-down renowned system that's already in the Dungeon Master's Guide and has already been printed in its full form in both Ravnica and Theros. So I, I want to know what it is about the 
Magic the Gathering settings that they really want to focus on that renown system <laughs> because and they're the only settings that seem to use it. Uh that I think and and why didn't they pursue it further with this book? So the way relationship works is it's you know, it introduces like a whole bunch of NPCs and and what I think is interesting uh, an interesting part of it is, uh, and these are like sort of minor benefits and like more social benefits than, you know, mechanical benefits, but uh, each NPC like has a benefit if you're their friend and then has like something that happens if you're their rival. Um, and the way to become someone's friend is just if you have an interaction with them. And you treat them nicely. Like, your score goes up by one. Uh, and if your score is two or more, they're your friend. Uh, and if you treat them poorly, or if you, like, say rude things or whatever, like, the score goes down by one. Uh, and if their score is, like, minus two or lower, then you're their rival. Uh, and I feel like... Like, it's it's a good start. And it did not go nearly far enough. Because, uh, like, that is the entirety of the system. And for me, that's not enough. Like, there's there's not enough gradation in that. Um, there is a thing where uh, if you're friends with somebody, you can, uh, they call it beloved. So if you can be, essentially, you can become, like, best friends or romantic partners or, you know, platonic, like, like almost siblings type thing uh and what that is is um you wake up with a point of inspiration but it also is you wake up with a point of inspiration for each beloved you have <laughs> as long as they remain your beloved so it's like i can see what they're going with that but that's also like that's that's very simple and i don't know if that's like to help foster narrative play with the fact that D and D does not really have social systems built into it, uh, but I, when they talked about it, it made me really excited because I thought that they were going to put social systems in here, and what we got was a watered down version of an existing system that already is in the Dungeon Masters. It's been in the since like day one. But it would be helpful if they actually fleshed it out and gave, like, a lot of examples of, of things that you could do. And from that front, like, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica is probably the best for that because it actually, like, tells you, it actually, you know, it gives you an example for each guild on, you know, what are specific things that you can do to increase your renown, what are specific benefits that you get at various renown levels. Um, and then Theros also uh, reused the concept for uh, piety um, in relation to your deities, since deities are very important to that setting. Uh, or, or if you're an iconoclast, uh, uh, your rejection of the deities. Um, but I think, like, they could have even done that. Like, they could have even just reused Renown and... Uh, introduce like a, a higher gradation of benefits um, and maybe like what are specific things like you know uh, uh, come up with like specific things that each NPC likes like if you do these things you know like I mean maybe this NPC you know likes baked goods you know so like if you make them baked goods they're like oh thank you uh, like, this is not a revolutionary concept. Like, it's, this is basically the relationship system in Stardew Valley, uh, <laughs> where at different levels, people, you know, they might give you different things or, you know, they might have different conversations with you or give, or have different benefits. And, you know, they like different they like different gifts. They, they have stuff that they don't like. Uh, and, you know, maybe a benefit like if you're an, or if you're a high enough friend with them. You know, when you give them something they don't like, maybe they're just like, oh, hey, listen, I don't really like this. I appreciate that you gave me something, but like, you know, it's not going to hurt our friendship. Whereas like at lower levels, they might be like, 
well, you don't like me then. <laughs> uh, I just, it, it strikes me as weird, especially since they touted it as a new system. Um, and especially like this, this comes on the heels of uh, Shriek Week being on Dimension 20, which was run by uh, Gabe Hicks, um, who ha I think has done some stuff for, for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, if not, you know, has worked on um, a lot of their own, you know, modules and everything eventually uh, was um, I've, I've talked about Gabe's stuff on the podcast before uh, the um, class based ability score module. Um, that, like, you narratively pick your ability scores based on your class. Uh, you know, things like that. You know, working with, uh, I believe working with Orion Black, uh, coming up with a, a, you know, I would say, a, you know, a, a new-ish system for that show. Uh, but, like, even that having a more robust relationship system uh, that like was essentially homebrewed for a four episode series that seems more fleshed out than what is in this book. Uh, so yeah, I apologize if I, if I seem critical, it's just once again, wizards really wanted to hype up. You know, that these are new systems and that they're going to be exciting and it's going to be a new way to play. And this really isn't. Uh, these are systems that already exist. This is this and this is essentially a watered down version of a system that already exists that they could have pushed it further. Uh, and here's the thing, like. With Renown. Like, it's not like it's tied to ability checks or anything like that, like. I mean, it could be. You know, just like, again, he used like the baked goods, like, hey, you help this person out. Like, so maybe, maybe i uh, use this example, like the baked goods. Maybe this person's a baker. Like, maybe you help them with a bake sale. Like, maybe you offer to help them with a bake sale. Like, that's, that's, if you'll pardon the pun, that's going to get you brownie points with them. Uh, and so that's going to boost your renown with them. You know, like if you just help offer to help them out with a bake sale. Uh, you know, just by showing up and, and helping out. There you go. And then for the infamy part is you could just lose renown and then maybe you have a negative track. Uh, you know, and, and the, the worse off you treat somebody or or. One of the things that they they. Like I thought was going to happen was like if you become friends with certain people it makes you rivals with other people. And that doesn't seem to be mentioned anywhere. Uh, you know, that it could be that, like, if you reach a certain renown level with a, with this NPC, uh, it reduces, like, as you gain renown with one NPC, it reduces renown with another one, because those two do not like each other. Uh, that's if you really wanted to play that up. Like, God, this makes me just want to write it myself. <laughs> so, so there's that. Uh, I, I have to say, so what I do like about this book is it gets my creative juices going. Um, which, uh, you know, is what I typically look for with, like, campaign settings. Um, but, uh... You know, I really, I just wish that it did more. Um. So. Uh, one of the other things that they talked about as a mechanic is like exams. So exams uh, are basically broken down into a study period where um, you basically decide whether you're going to study for your exam uh, and then how you study for your exam. It's an ability check. And then if you make your ability check, you get like uh essentially like guidance dice that you get to apply um and then it's uh and then the exam itself is a specified ability check um and i think exams like usually come in two portions where like it's a it's a 
um, sort of uh, a standard exam format and then like an essay exam format. Um, and it's basically like two different ability checks that you can then add re or re rolls or bonus dice to. Um, so, I mean, you know, that uh, that's it's. But, uh, you know, I can't really remember. Now that now that I think it because like I, I briefly skimmed it, but I can't really remember like what the benefits or consequences are for like for for doing well or doing poorly on an exam. Um I'm gonna look it up real quick. Uh so I know if you if you fail an exam, which is you get two failures, uh I think it's something where like you're put on academic probation. And you can't do extracurriculars. Um, let's see. Where is the exams? Here we go. Uh, do, 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 do. All right. So. Uh, all right. So. So to rewind things a little bit. So studying is there's a couple different things that you can do. Uh, is, you know, normal studying. Uh, you get to, it's, you work with the, the dungeon master to make an ability check. And it's sort of like up to you to figure out what that ability check is. Um, as long as it like is relevant to studying whatever is at hand, uh, if that's successful, you get a reroll during testing. You can pull an all-nighter, which basically gives you a level of exhaustion uh, that takes effect at the start of the day of the exam. Doesn't go away until after the exam. Uh, but you get two rerolls. Uh, I feel like that's silly. Because a level of exhaustion gives you disadvantage on ability checks. So that just, that just seems silly to me. Uh, Unless, now, you can you you can have two or more characters in a study group, uh, so that each person. Oh, that's just during the studying phase. You get advantage on your ability check during studying. Um. Uh, oh yeah. So yeah, pulling an all nighter. Uh, you get two re rolls if you succeed. Uh, or. You can just skip studying and you just forego the chance of rerolls. So this is where, like, maybe you're a character with expertise and you have a bunch of, like, and you have expertise and a bunch of skills that are probably relevant to your exams. You might just not, <laughs> you might just be good enough that you just don't study for your exams. Uh, I mean, I, I may have done that a couple times in college. <laughs> where i didn't study uh and i and i did okay that was typically by my senior year and they were like in electives that i you know like i knew enough and i studied you know in class and uh thankfully uh the professor allowed um so like in place of written response questions he said you know a picture's worth a thousand words so if you can if you can draw a diagram that talks about it instead of describing it go for it and i was like perfect this is great. Uh, so in this case, like it would be like doing performance instead of uh, <laughs> instead of something. Um, so for the exam. All right. So two ability checks uh, with specific DCs noted during the exam encounter. Uh, you can use any rerolls uh, that you gain during studying. Um, you fail if you make no successful ability checks. Uh, you pass if you get one successful, if you get at least one successful ability check, you get a student die. And then you aced it if you get both ability checks, which you get two student dice. Um, it does talk about uh, how you can cheat, which is 
uh, basically you can substitute for the exams uh, deception and sleight of hand uh, for for the skills being used for the exam. Uh, you, if you fail either of them, uh, so it's basically all or nothing. Like you have to get both, in which case you ace the exam. If you fail either of them, you you just you fail the exam, and you're caught cheating. Um, all right. So if you fail an exam, uh, you're required to attend tutoring until they achieve at least a past exam in a different encounter. Uh, and basically it prevents you from taking extracurriculars or jobs uh, until the next exam. Um, so student die gained from exam is a D4, so it's like a guidance die, uh, can roll and add to any ability check the player makes. Uh, provided the check is uses one of the two skills featured in the exam. Uh, you can wait until after rolling the D20, but you have to do so before the DM says it succeeds or fails. You can't apply more than one die per check, uh, and you can't roll it again until after you finish a long rest. Uh, at the end of each academic year, uh, you lose any dice uh, you've earned from a particular exam. Um, and they have like a little tracking sheet where you can track this stuff that comes in the book. Uh, so we talk about extracurriculars and jobs. So extracurriculars are clubs that give you student dice. Works the same way. Each uh, The clubs are um, related to two skills. It gives you student dice related to those skills. Uh, and it gives you relationship points. Um, you gain either a positive or negative relationship point with one student NPC who is also a member of the club. Um, so this is a thing where uh, I think it's an interesting way of adding a little more nuance to skills where it gives you like temporary boons uh to specific skills i think it's i think this is one of the more interesting things uh that they do in the book um you know uh, i think it's a, it it gets a little finicky because they're they're short term uh you know that you can only use let's see how is that worded uh Okay, so it's, so for example, let's say you're in an extracurricular and you ace an exam. That gives you four student dice, uh, I believe. Sorry, no, that gives you three student dice. Um, and so uh, it would also give you three student dice to be able to use in four different skills, uh, sort of. Um but, uh, you know, you have things like Dragon Chess Club, which uh, is deception and investigation. Um, and then they talk about who are the members. Uh, you know, Rampart or Talana. Um, and they have, you know, things that they, they do and stuff. There is one club that I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of the you know you could you could model this so that like you know you could think about you know if you went to college what were the clubs on campus right uh and then you know you sort of use that as a basis um i went to williams college we had a whole slew of clubs uh sometimes we even had redundant clubs um as was the case uh like especially my senior year when there was like a board game club that was set up by a group of freshmen that uh was sort of encroaching on the turf of like the the gaming club um which was also sort of like the role playing club um and i think people got hung up on like names and thought that like oh well that's the role playing club all they do is role playing games well, we want to do board games and it's like well no we do all of it stop leeching members away from us uh but anyway so uh you know there's also intramurals uh they have 
there is a LARP guild. So you could, you can play a wizard going to college that then joins, you can, you can be role-playing a character who then, uh, joins a club to then play a role-playing game or do live-action role-playing as a character. <laughs> it's something we see, like, really, really funny stuff of, like, you're playing characters that are then playing a role-playing game within a game. Uh, this is exactly that. Uh, uh, and it's animal handling and performance. Uh, these storytelling enthusiasts engage on, in a mix of strategy and play acting, often involving mascots, when they enact fantastical narratives that they resolve with special rules. Uh, it's great. That's great. Um, I love the fact that they they decided to put a role-playing club inside of a role-playing game. Um, yeah. It, it is... If Every time I... If, if I ever get the chance to play this adventure multiple times uh, with different groups... I don't I don't care. I'm going to have my character join that that group every time. Every time. Doesn't matter what kind of character I make. Uh You know, they have a uh band. They have a faith group. Uh the the school newspaper. Uh a weightlifting group. You know, drama club. Cheer squad. Uh, future business club, <laughs> uh, horticulture, dragon chess, uh, historical society, which is like a debate group. Um, basically a whole bunch like a fine artists club, like an arts club. Um, dead languages society. Uh, you could expand this out further. Um, I I think it's great. the The extracurriculars are, I think, one of my favorite parts of the book um so the other one is a job so normally you get to pick two extracurriculars um you can forego one of your extracurriculars uh to instead get a job uh so instead of student dice or instead of a student die and skills uh that you can use for skills you instead just get you get a living stipend <laughs> you just get money uh which uh you get five gold a week. Uh and and a positive or negative relationship point. Um that's all it does. <laughs> it's you know, I kind of wish that like there was a little more nuance to it. Um especially like I they could have easily have done like the downtime rules for doing different things. Um but uh yeah. Ultimately, like, I wish the book did more so that I would not have to come up with systems. That said, it's a nice starting point for me to brainstorm my own stuff. Um, you know, that, like, relationships, you could use Renown. You could do more stuff with extracurriculars. You could treat them like own little mini backgrounds. Uh, you know, job could be more like of a downtime activity. You could have extracurriculars be involved in downtime activity stuff. Um, so yeah. Now, so that gets into a lot of like the, the subsystems, like being a student at the school. Uh, here's the thing. Sorry for that long, dramatic pause. Uh, the adventure itself. I don't want to. I don't want to talk too much about the adventure itself because I don't want to spoil anything. Um. So the adventure is a little weird in that, like, it's not. Like there are times when you will take multiple exams through the course of an adventure. Uh, there are times when you only get one exam during an adventure, um, or part of an adventure, I should say. Uh. But a lot of the adventure is kind of left up to the DM and the players to fill in the blanks. So, like, 
there's a lot of times when uh it'll just say like uh like an npc that the that uh one of the characters has befriended you know comes up to them and offers to do a thing like it won't specifically call out people like it leaves it up to you to figure out like okay who's gonna show up um or like after the exam like you all go to the pub uh and you know it'll kind of say like you know and you have a little like there's not really a lot of codified things and it lets it 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 kind of puts it onto the dm and the players to basically improvise like what are you doing you know what conversations are you having uh because otherwise it's it's very much like a okay well you do an exam all right uh then like we're gonna skip to this thing that happens like a couple days later uh so there there's just there's a lot of filling in the blanks um that i think a traditional D D group might have a problem with, or like what you consider the stereotypical D D group might have trouble with um i think if it's a group um that is more used to doing games where uh you kind of have to fill in that narrative uh or more narrative games or more social games like they won't have a problem with this um but i think especially like if you're a new player maybe and joining a group of people that you don't know this might be a little intimidating um i think this is definitely definitely adventure where you want to do a session zero to get like what everybody's looking for out of the adventure uh or out of the campaign um and what people are comfortable with um like it is a college or it is a group of colleges which i know like has some sort of nebulous meaning um I, I do find it weird that, uh, like, there is a pub on campus, but they don't have, uh, like, there's no ale or wine on the menu. It's, like, all non-alcoholic drinks. And I don't know, like, if the intention is for this to actually be, like, if you're going to run this as a high school. But, like, there's nothing, like, it's all very, like, university-based. So it just, it struck me as odd, like that the options are like water, cola, <laughs> like you can get soda. That seems weird to me that like this is canonically D and D, and you can just order like a Pepsi. <laughs> it, it seems a little off. Like it, it it feels more of like for my campaign setting, which is supposed to be like eighties derived um but uh yeah i don't i don't know how i feel i think i think it's really gonna like what you get out of the adventure i think is going to be even more dependent on your group than like a typical adventure will be um like there are some adventures where you know you can kind of run it with different groups and get the same experience out of it. Um, I think this one is going to be very, very dependent on like what people, like how creative people are going to be, how willing to improv people are going to be, whether they enjoy doing the little bits of like downtime and what, what are you doing to fill time? Uh, and like, what are you doing in your off time? Um, like, are you the kind of group that, you can show up for D&D and you end up just doing social role playing for four hours and not do a combat, not do it, not even do an ability check. Uh, you know, I, I think that group is going to excel at this particular adventure just because it's so often there's like it's just built into the adventure where there's just blocks of uh, doing that that role playing that free form role playing i should say um so yeah 
uh, there's a section at the end with a bunch of different uh, basically NPC and monster stats. Um, it looks like a lot, but then you realize that, uh, you know, a whole bunch of them are just like a progression of the various colleges. So it's like uh, Lorehold Apprentice, Lorehold Pledge Mage, Lorehold Professor of Chaos, Lorehold Professor of Order. So, like, that's four that really are, like, derivations of one archetype. Um, and then you've got, like, the five mascots. Uh, they also have five dragons. Uh, I guess each each college was founded by a dragon to teach mortals magic. Um, and, like, the dragon is supposed to be emblematic of, like, the ideals of that, uh, of that college, right? So you have, like, Velamachus Lorehold. <laughs> uh, you know, and each of the dragons has, you know, special legendary actions, uh, you know, a special breath weapon. They have, uh, some limited spell casting that they can do. Um, I've seen some folks complain about how they should feel more like spellcasters and that they don't like it. Uh, I don't know. Just give them spellcasting then. Wizards has already said they're trying to cut down on, on monster stat blocks because uh, spellcasters, like, it's a common complaint is spellcaster stat blocks. People don't like having to go consult, like, a second or third book when just trying to run a monster or an NPC. Uh, it's, you know, I don't like it. I don't like it. And I'm a, I'm a seasoned player and seasoned DM of the game. Like, I don't like, just give me all the stats in the stat block, uh, which I'm going to bring up again. You know what edition did that? Fourth edition. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. Fourth edition plug again. Uh, one of these days I'm going to, I'm going to start that project back up of rewriting a whole bunch of fifth edition monsters using fourth edition stat blocks, uh, just to show how great they were, um, including, uh, uh, information you would get from a related knowledge check, uh, like nature or arcana or something. Um, but, uh, yeah, all in all, you know, some interesting little monsters in there, um. I do like the mascots. I think the mascots are interesting. Um, I mean, really, like, a lot of the, you know, the Silver Quill Professor of Radiance. Like, these all just feel like Ravnica guild, guild mages. Um, and again, they're literally, they're just spellcasters. So, I I kind of find them boring. Because it's like, their only defining features are they just get a spell list. And it's like, ah, that's, No. Make them do cool things that, like, replicate spells. Uh, so. Uh, but uh, one thing, so so to kind of wrap up my, uh, my deep dive, um, one thing that I like about the progression of the adventure is it introduces each section, or I should say each adventure within the campaign uh, as... If you're going to run this as a standalone adventure uh, and like a little sidebar of like things to modify for it, um, just either from like a uh, from a narrative standpoint and as well as a mechanical standpoint of like, here's things that you can ignore. Here's things that you can substitute in. Like, here's re different reasons for this to happen. Um, I think that's great. Uh, especially if you want to, like, pick and choose bits from the book. Um, I think, uh, that would have been great for Frostmaiden. Because there's a lot of stuff in Frostmaiden that, like, would make an, uh, would make a great one-shot adventure. Um, and I think, unfortunately, it gets, it gets bogged down in, like, the, the, like, the whole second chapter of the campaign is, like, going out and doing random stuff to try and just learn more about the area. Uh, and I think there's a couple other campaign uh, uh, books that have that problem where, like, 
after you do the the intro, it then opens it up to like be more of a sandbox as opposed to like a coherent story path. Um, and like, which you know, if you want to do a sandbox thing, like fine, but at least introduce ways on how to like breadcrumb stuff uh, better so that it's not just like a big jumbled mess. Um, but that said, I do like uh, how to run each section as a standalone adventure so that if you want to do it as a series of one shots, as opposed to a, you know, full fledged coherent campaign, you can do that. So, uh, like I said, all in all, I was expecting campaign setting. Uh, not necessarily an adventure, um, you know, that it would have like uh, an adventure within it. Um, so I'm a little disappointed this uh, I, I'm kind of swung back onto you know, I, initially I was like, eh, I don't know. You know, I mean, I'll get it on D&D Beyond, but I don't think it's really going to be, you know, all that for me. Like, I'll I'll pick apart the, the setting pieces to throw them into my own campaign uh, as, like, Magical University, but not really, you know, anything uh, that I think I'm going to be interested in. Um, and then, like, they when they talked about it at D&D Live or whatever, they talked about all these systems, and I was like, oh, no, this is going to be cool. You know, I got I'm going to get this book. I'm going to use everything out of it. This sounds great. And then now that seeing it in action once again, because Wizards did this to me with Rhyme of the Frostmaiden when they talked up all the survival mechanics and we're going to have fishing. Y'all know how much I love fishing. Uh, I'm going to spam those emotes in the chat. Doot, doot. Uh, uh, you know, fishing subsystem and fishing mechanics in games. Uh, that turned out like that, that they're literally not anything different than what's in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And then the fishing is just like making survival checks. And it's like, at least get fishing tackle classified as a tool. Because it is. Uh, it was like, fool me once, wizards. Shame on me. Fool me twice. Shame on you. Uh, or, you know. However that goes. <laughs> I think I might have it backwards. Uh, like, come on. Like, y you can't do that a second time. Like, play up all these mechanics and everything, and then the book comes out and it's like, oh, so what you mean to say is they're existing mechanics and you didn't even go far enough into implementing them. Uh, I don't like that. So I'm kind of back to the, I won't pick this up in a physical format. I have it on D&D Beyond. Um, you know, also so that I can share it with my players. Uh, I, I would say all in all, um, it's hard to grade really, because I feel like so much of the adventure is going to be dependent on your group. Like if you don't have a group that's going to come up with like downtime stuff or, or role plays well, like maybe they're just not feeling the role playing and they're, they're a little shy. Maybe, maybe they don't know each other and they're not comfortable, you know, opening up and doing that. I think you're going to have a worse time. I think you're going to have a tough time with this adventure. Uh, so I don't know. Just from the character option standpoint, I'm not impressed. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's a... I think for what I got getting the digital version, um, it's a good starting point for me to flesh stuff out a bit more and to do my own... Uh, college experience <laughs> for D&D. &D. Um, so yeah. All right. I talked about uh, that long enough. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to switch gears and uh, just a really quick update on quest log. All right. I said really quick, quick update for quest log. Here's the update. Did not get seven comics done uh, between, uh, you know, my wife being away last weekend, uh, which Saturday turned out to be a very busy day in order to keep kiddo occupied. Uh, we were out almost all day. Uh, and then Sunday was recovering from that, which did not go well. Um, and that was a tough day to then not feeling well, then all sorts of uh, other stuff happening. I think I only got three comics done out of seven. Um, goal is got to do seven this week. The goal is to, the ultimate goal is to finish that book. Um, so I really, I really got to get into gear. So, uh, 
coloring seven chapter one eight bit adventures comics uh here's the added benefit is when they are all done so not only is there going to be am i going to try and get a book put together that will be available print on demand i think um i'm going to start uploading or replacing the black and white line art comics with the full color versions on the website um just in case you know anybody decides to come back and want to reread the comic on the website from start to finish um but ultimately the goal is to do this for a print product so all right that's it this has been running on far too long i talked too long about strixhaven but that's okay uh you know hopefully i did not spoil anything uh for anyone um you know i tried to avoid uh talking about the contents of the adventure itself aside from sort of mechanical progression of things um i was it does try and take you from level one to level eight to ten i think so it does fall into that trap of it, it's not high level D D. uh but uh there you go so uh hopefully if that makes if that is helpful advice for you one way or the other um i'm glad you know if if you think bah, sean you just hate things i'm gonna support local game stores anyways go go get it from the local game store the alt cover is really nice so go pick up that uh other than that we're done so uh if you want to find more stuff by 8-bit adventures you can check out 8-bitadventures.com uh over there you can find uh podcast links um streams videos artwork comics more all that jazz if you would like to help support that content you be you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash 8-bit adventures uh there we go uh big shout out thank you to all of our current patrons thank you for keeping uh stuff like this podcast afloat um um you can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and that gets you like early access to the comic um, which is still like several weeks out. Uh, so you've got a you got a big jump on everybody else. And uh, finally, our opening theme is a one up by Professor Shy Guy. You can check out his work over at professorshyguy.bandcamp.com. Once again, thank you to Professor Shy Guy for letting us use uh, that music for our theme. So with that, we are done. Actually done this time. Uh, thank you all for joining me uh, if you're watching live, and thank you for listening if you're an audio podcast listener. Um, if you enjoy this uh, on on a podcast app, um, please consider uh, going to iTunes or, I don't know, Apple Podcasts or whatever, wherever you rate uh, the stuff or Google Play or whatever. Rate this podcast five stars so that uh, it gets a little more traction uh, in, in those feeds. Um, and uh once again thank you thank you for listening thank you for showing up thank you for supporting and as always have fun happy gaming and enjoy your pie cake